name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, we share in something that comes from Adam and Eve, the desire to do things quickly. When uh, Eve was offered the credit card to take and use it quickly, she said, yes, I want to be like God instantly. That caused us the tragedy. And we want to do things quickly. And it's in our nature somehow to strive, to run, and, and go and do. And we want to see success out of that. And if it's fast, man, we'll take it. And we'll go again and run. And we want to see the fruit of our labor coming out quickly. Somehow, time is not enough for us to do things that we want to bring success and fruit very quickly. This is our human mind. But God doesn't think this way. God comes with a different perspective of time. He doesn't want things to be done fast. He doesn't want things to be done slowly. God works in a rhythm, in a cycle. God plants seeds and looks for the harvest later. He's the sower, he's the reaper. And these cycles and this rhythm of God is sometimes unknown to men. But for us Christians, it's been revealed and given the way to enter in the cycle of God's. Look at this. If God was to reach a success or fruits of his labor, he would have taken flesh through the Virgin Mary. Quickly, at the age of a few years, he was so smart and so gifted over everybody else. He had the power to go and recruit, say, 12 men. He could have surely found 12 kings on earth, powerful men, with a lot of money, with a lot of connections, with a lot of, uh, in our terms, megabits in the pipe to communicate and do, and, but he did not. Had he done so, had he gone for a quick success and quick fruits of his labor through qualified people, empowered people, he wouldn't have been any different than all the leaders before him who tried to do precisely this. Instead, the Lord, the providence of God, and His love for mankind doesn't seek success and fruits. He seeks your salvation and mine. Different story here. Our salvation is something between God and us. No kings can influence that. No money can change it. Of course they can if we give in to them. So instead of the 12 kings, he recruited the simple men, the ones who could perhaps could not even read or write, the fishermen, simple, couldn't even talk very well. In the gospel lesson today, the encounter is in Galilee. We hear about Andrew and Peter. We know about we hear about John and James, the sons of Zebedee. And we know from the Gospel of St. John that this is not the first encounter they had with the Lord. Andrew is called the first of the disciples. In today's reading, he's named the second. Why is this? Because by the river Jordan, they were there next to John the Baptist, his disciples. That's where they encountered the Lord the first time. Andrew is the first one to go to the Lord and then go to, to Peter and recruit him and so on. So today, they're found fishing or mending the nets because they're very poor, you see? Like the opposite of the kings. And the Lord gives them separately the same commandment. Follow me. Follow me. And they were fishing. They dropped the net. They left the business and they went. John and James left the boat, the repair of the, of the nets, and the family, who's probably in need of their strength to carry on when they're going to retire. They left everything behind and obeyed the commandment of the Lord, 
follow me. Now, you know, in the English language, just like in other languages, we talk in sentences. And I'm sure some of you here must have struggled in your lives at some point or another to learn a different language. I did. Quite a few of them. And invariably, in all my efforts, I encounter great difficulty in learning and mastering the verbs. There's a, Alexia, is that right, with Latin? With the verbs? It's a pain with the verbs. To conjugate them, all tenses, and all the things, and oh, oh gosh, man, you never get it right. Unless you speak that tongue from your mother's womb. So there's something, there's something with the verbs in the languages, and it appears to be something with the verbs in our lives as well. You know, the Lord himself describes himself, and we talk about him in different words, trying to make sentences, but before getting to the verbs, we use nouns. And we say the Lord Jesus is the Savior, he is the Master, he is God, he is the true God of true God, he is light of light, and so on. We describe him in nouns, and our heart rejoices, knowing that we come close to such a God who is beautiful. And this beauty we express by adding to the nouns, what do we do? Adjectives. Adje ad adjectives. Yeah, I got it right. And we describe how the Lord is. He's holy, he's mighty, he's noble. And we like this, and we come close to God, and, and you know, we, we'd like to, to do this. And they, the, uh, this image of God in our lives is conducive to increasing our faith. But our God is also verbs. <laughs> it won't make sense if there wasn't any verb associated with God. God loves, God creates. God blesses, God forgives, God restores, God saves. They're all actions. We don't have a passive God to sit as a statue here on the table to bow down in front of it like people did in the old days, in front of Paul's. We had a God who's active, who condescended, who took flesh, and so on. So for us, for us brothers and sisters, we hear the calling today, Follow me. It hits the nail on the head. It says, verb, verb, verb. Do something. Verb. Action. Yes, I am God, the Almighty. Yes, I am the Savior, the Almighty, the, the noble one. But time to love. Time to give. Time to share. Time to offer. Time to sacrifice. Time to follow me. So today's message is one of action. In fact, it's a message of radical action, of changing lives. When? Immediately. This is the moment. The Holy Spirit between you and I and me and the altar. The gospel is calling us to follow the Lord. And every year we hear this at the same time. Right after Pentecost, right after we saw what the Holy Spirit could do in the life of the church, all saints, and now we're called to follow the Lord. So he will make us, Alexia, fishermen, not with a pole, but with a net. With a net. And this is the role of the church, the calling we have all together here. But you know what? I think we like to to bring up our faith. And we say, yes, Father, we believe. We believe. And that's an action. That's hard work to do. Our faith, we believe. In fact, we have a good answer for that. If people ask us, do you believe? Are you a believer? What would you answer? Sure. I am a believer. Definitely. But what if we're asked something that takes us from the realm of nouns and adjectives into the realm of verbs. <laughs> what if somebody came to ask you, are you a follower of Christ? Well, I tell you, this is something that would make us kind of like the anemone we saw the other weekend. I will probably 
closing myself so what you're doing is a private matter it's a personal thing mind your own business but the fact is brothers and sisters that the followers of Christ were asked to follow him into the world in the world to bring the light not under a bushel but to light the whole world they are visible so the answer is implicit here people can see if we are followers of Christ you know some people have Christianity within them to give them a status some sort of respect in the community based on their faith and you know they might stop there not taking the step higher to get a little bit more Christianity and faith to make them uncomfortable I'd like you to get uncomfortable today Christianity the message of the gospel was brought to Christ to make people uncomfortable so they will find comfort in the kingdom those are the ones that we call nominal Christians the plague of our century who believe the nouns and the adjectives who turn to God when the time comes of struggle of need of pain and suffering but otherwise they don't know the verbs they do not follow Christ now following Christ is not an easy, it's not an easy thing you know this is right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount the whole Sermon on the Mount three chapters is a description of what it means to follow Christ a few things here that we struggle with trusting God wholly trusting God wholly this is the one where he says where your treasure is your heart is as well don't put your treasure in the worldly things where rust and moth and, and thieves can destroy but invest up there the followers of Christ use another verb here invest properly it's hard to trust in God that if I give another verb he will take care of me afterwards yeah if I give generously he might give me even more to give away generously instead we might put on the side to have for the dark days maybe the inflation will go up another 10 percent trust holy trust in the things that that we do daily life he says don't be anxious when you follow me don't be anxious what you're going to eat we're going to put on the pagans the Gentiles do that but you when you follow me do what seek the kingdom first and the rest will be added to that is this easy well not quite how about this one here do not judge for with a measure you judge you'll be judged called to be fishermen we're blessed to have newcomers to the church we go out in the world to fish and we see people who are different than us he's saying don't judge them don't judge them what they did if they're fishermen if they were poor whatever they have done it doesn't matter the calling here is for them to follow Christ and as soon as they do that they will change do not judge instead do what take care of the plank in your eye before you go to the speck of the neighbor's eye so you can see work on the plank and then go and do something what else does he say in this to follow him follow the will of God and so on so these are all hard things to do oh persevere in prayer what I say seek and you shall find ask first ask and you shall receive knock and you shall be open to you. no seek and you shall find knock and it'll be open to you how do you ask in prayer you say how do we seek seek in the scriptures seek in the holy fathers learn about him we follow seek the path seek the way seek the truth what was the last one ask knock knock and it shall be open to you the truth will be given to you that's all you need the truth capital T he's the person he comes to you he's given to you he's offered to you 
So all these, it's not easy. I remember last night, two nights ago, we watched the movie Man of God about St. Nectarius of Vegina, a saint of the last century. He died in 1934, 36. I know some of you, many of you watched it in the theaters. A bishop uh, from Northern Africa, people got jealous, clergy got jealous against him, and he was slandered. Calumny and slander, rejection from his see, from his people, followed him through his whole life. A man persecuted by the church and many times by the faithful gathered in the church, poisoned by bishops themselves and some priests. A life of the man who never turned against God, followed Christ in pain and suffering. And as we were watching the movie here Friday evening, I wish you were here, somebody said, Father, there's no, no, no joy in, in the movie at all. There's no happiness in this. There's no happiness. And in the movie, indeed, you see him going through the whole thing, but he appears, St. Nectarius, with joy coming from within. From, with peace. With peace. Abundant peace. Such that the director of the school, you might remember, the, the, the seminary there, at the very end when St. Nectarius left, went to finally thank him in a little bit of repentance. They butted heads. The director didn't, didn't swallow Nectarius. And uh, um, he remarks, says, I see, Elder, that you have peace. <laughs> really? And, and Nectarius asks him, do you have peace? This is a very smart man, very intellectual, all rational. Thought about it and said, no. No. It's because of your God. It's because of your God who doesn't give me that peace. Because I put everything through my mind. I think of everything. And I don't have that peace. I don't have the peace. So St. Nectarius is an example of the cost of following Christ. Putting the verbs into practice. St. Nectarius is one of those, just like the disciples, who left everything behind. There was a time there when he arrived at the school and asked, what do the students worship? This was a seminary. And they said, oh, they go to the church across the street. And they there. said, well, what happens? There's no chapel here in, in the, at the school? And they said, yes, but it's not functional. So said, why not? We don't have funds to restore it. And St. Nectarius said, that's impossible. We have to fix it. So we don't have the funds. I'll give you my salary. It will be done on my salary. He left it behind. And another example there of following Christ, when one of the students who was on half a scholarship at the seminary got sick, the leadership, the director of the school and the other one who were leading there got together with Nectarius to send him to a, to a sanatory, to, to a way to die, pretty much. And St. Nectarius says, you cannot do that. This is an excellent student. We cannot do this to him. He needs to go to a doctor first. And they said, we don't have money. He has to go to a doctor. The hospital is across the street. And they said, we cannot afford this. Pretty much what you say, it's not in the budget. He said, I'll make it happen. I'll pay for it. Guess what? He went to the hospital. They couldn't figure out what was it. What was wrong with him? St. Nectarius visited with him. Found out that it was a spiritual struggle of his that got him sick. I would spare you that. You watch the movie. Came back and told the boys, the seminarians, tonight, all night vigil. Leave it all behind. Homework, food, you name it. All behind. We follow Christ tonight to rescue this, this young boy. They did. And he was healed. Yes, brothers and sisters. This is it. This is it. There's a cost for it. We have to pay the cost to follow Christ. Did you ever estimate this following Christ in terms of the cost you have to pay? Hey, but I'll challenge you on this. What is it that was the cost of not following Christ? Did you ever think in these terms? Did you think that Christ is the one who brings fulfillment and fullness in the world where people are totally confused and they cannot find north from south and day from night? They don't know who they are and what they seek? They don't even go to work anymore in America. He brings fulfillment. Right? Doesn't say, I came to bring life 
abundant life to dead people? What else would you miss by not following him? What's the cost of missing him? Forgiveness. He's the one who forgives the sins for the kingdom. As far as east is from the west, he takes our sin away and restores us. What else does he do? He brings peace, the peace of St. Nectarius. He says, peace I brought to you, not like the world, but the peace of God. And this is what the priest offers to the parishioners here in the church when he blesses facing this way from the altar. What else does he offer? Freedom. He says, I am the truth. The truth will bring you freedom. From what? From sin and corruption and passions. And this is the call today to follow him. To come out of the net of impossible movements, joy, peace, fulfillment, freedom. The, 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 the aspects of our sinful life. To be released from these. So on this Sunday, brothers and sisters, with great joy, we thank God that He's calling us to follow Him. To leave behind the old and to labor to be the new. Yeah, He's the one who makes this call. Follow me to be my children. Follow me to be my disciples. Follow me to be my apostles. How do we do this, brothers and sisters? Remember, God is not rushing. God is not slow. He has a rhythm because He's not after success. He's not after fruits. He's after our salvation. The rhythm that is given to us to follow Christ is the rhythm of the church. We follow Christ with zeal. I know some of the, the catechumens here have so much zeal, so much desire. To, to follow Christ. I was in this situation when I went to the seminary, when I was ordained, when I came to, to the new parish. There's, there's so much in the beginning. We desire this. And when we have this desire, God gives us grace. And that together brings beautiful fruits, brings beautiful growth. But with time as we progress, that following, that walking behind, okay, goes more, shifts more into this, the comfortable space of faith. I have faith, and this is good enough. And we, forgot, we forget about going after Christ, following Him. In fact, the danger is that we can drift away and walk away from Him. So, brothers and sisters, how is your participation in this rhythm? In the rhythm of prayer at home, in the rhythm of fasting, Attending the services with zeal, being present on time, being present prepared from home, having read the prayers and maybe the readings. Participating in the sacraments of the church, coming prepared for the, for the Holy Communion, being regular with your confession, and having that joy of following Christ. Not the joy of a success that goes away before we know about it and becomes bitter. Not the ephemeral fruits of our labor that we desire very quickly, but the joy that comes from within, like with St. Nectarius, and brings light to the world, and thus throws the net to bring others to the church. So it is. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they received the call. And they answered without words. They went for the verb. Immediately, this was the beginning of their journey to peace, freedom, love, and the kingdom. Can we make these our first steps as well, along with them today? Amen. Please rise.